NACDL is the Association of the Nation's Criminal Defense Bar. Hour number two. Um, so we're going to talk about investigating a false confession claim in this next phase and what we do um, once we decide to take a case for investigation purposes. And it involves investigating within the four corners of the confession and what additional investigation outside of the confession that we do. But when we think about these cases, we find it helpful to use a framework that Richard Leo developed and that he and I wrote an article about, which are the three pathways to a false confession. These are three errors that occur in every single case of a proven false confession. The first is the misclassification error. What made the police think that the innocent person was guilty? That's your first question you have to answer. Why did they go wrong in the first instance? The next question, of course, is a coercion error, and this is the stuff of voluntariness and Miranda challenges that you're all accustomed to doing in your pretrial motions. Um, how was the client convinced, persuaded, pressured, tortured, cajoled, beaten into confessing? And the final error, which is really, in my mind, the most um, important error at trial and in post-conviction, is the contamination error. The first two errors explain why someone was arrested and explain why somebody was charged. Um, the contamination error explains why somebody was convicted. Why is that? confession so detailed? How did the client know what to say? You need to answer these three questions in order to form a compelling narrative of innocence. So the first of these three errors that we try to answer in our investigations is the misclassification error. Again, as Steve said, is how did the police get the wrong person in the interrogation room in the first place? So to answer that question, you need to know that there are two stages, generally, of police questioning that happen in any given criminal case. There's the interview stage, and then there's the interrogation stage. The interview stage is information seeking. It's an officer sitting with a lot of different people, maybe, asking open-ended questions about a crime. Where were you when this happened? What do you know about the victim? What can you tell us about the way that this, about what you saw or what you didn't see? Open-ended questions. The officer isn't doing a lot of talking. They're letting the person that they're questioning do a lot of the talking. It's information gathering. Then there's the second stage, interrogation. This is the type of questioning that happens not to gather information, but to get an admission. That's the goal of interrogation. It happens after the police have come to the judgment, you are guilty, and now we need to get that admission out of your mouth. The interview, which is uh, the first of these two stages, that often behaves, what often in involves what's called behavioral analysis. This is a read and associates term. It essentially, in my view and, and our view, equates to human lie detection. It's the, the concept that deception, lying, manifests itself totally involuntarily in certain behaviors, mannerisms, choice of words, things like that, that involuntarily express themselves while you're talking. And the theory behind behavioral analysis is that a properly trained detective can read so these unconscious signs of deception. So this is a page from the Reed Interrogation Manual, which is called Criminal Interrogations and Confessions. And it shows, it's, a, it's, an instru it's instructions for detectives who are conducting this first stage interview where they're asking open-ended questions, where they're letting the person that they're questioning kind of spout off and answer these questions at length all the while they're evaluating that person for these behavioral cues. So according to Reed and Associates, you can see on the left-hand side, deceptive denials. These are things that, if said, indicate deception. 
And on the right-hand side, you can see truthful denial, things that, if said, are supposed to indicate that the person is telling the truth. Deceptive denials. I honestly wouldn't do that. It means you're lying. I swear I didn't do this. Also bad, don't say that to the cops, it means you're lying. On the other hand, apparently what you're supposed to say instead of those sort of quote unquote qualified statements, you're supposed to be using descriptive language. I did not rape her, it means you're telling the truth. I didn't do that to her, on the other hand, means you're lying. That doesn't have that descriptive language. Uh, on and on it goes, uh, specific denials, uh, I don't own a gun, means you're lying, too specific. Broad denials is truthful. I've never had sexual contact with that student or any other. Important, right? Um, these are the sorts of things that, 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 that Reed trains uh, its detectives to be looking at during these, these behavioral analysis uh, interviews. And it goes on. This is from a presentation um, by the president, the current president of Reed and Associates, um, which I should say is the most widely used interrogation training method in the country. It has been for decades. This is a, a presentation that Joe Buckley, the president of Reed, gave at the University of Arkansas. And in it, he describes the differences according to the principles of behavioral analysis, the differences between a truthful individual and a deceptive in individual. I like this one. A truthful individual is composed, concerned, and cooperative. Kind of sounds like a Boy Scout. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, a deceptive individual slouches, so watch out for that. Uh, a uh, truthful person will have open palms while they speak. I, I always found that one interesting. And, and you can see there are different things they're looking for. They're looking for attitude, they're looking at nonverbal behavior and verbal behavior. That your choice of words, according to Reed, is even a giveaway as, for, as to whether you're lying. Uh, if you give reasonable answers, a smooth tone of voice, that's, that means you're lying. Uh, if you say, I can't recall, that means, uh, I'm sorry, that means you're lying as well. If you refer to God or religion, don't do that because then you're just sunk in the eyes of Reed and Associates. So you can see on and on, I think this makes the point that this behavioral analysis is basically a bunch of garbage. Um, Reed and Associates claims an 85% accuracy rate. They claim that these types of behavioral analysis uh, techniques are 85% accurate in, de in detecting whether the person you're speaking to is telling the truth or lying. But virtually every study out there shows that even a person trained in behavioral analysis, even the most experienced seasoned police officer, really does no better than chance. No better than about, around the neighborhood of 50%, give or take, about telling whether the person is lying or not. People are not lie detectors. People speak in different ways. I'm sure I've just, in, in, the, in the course of giving this presentation, maybe my palms weren't open. You know, I mean, these sorts of <laughs> mannerisms manifest all over the place. There's no human behavior or physiological response that is unique to lying. That's what the science out there shows. So even if police officers get it right and somebody is being deceptive in the interrogation, they don't necessarily, doesn't necessarily mean that they're being deceptive about the crime with which they're being charged. People tell lies for a variety of different reasons, sometimes for, to protect um, their, themselves or, or loved ones. Doesn't necessarily mean that just because you're not telling the entire truth to the police that you murdered and raped a 15-year-old girl. So it, it's, it's bad science um, for both those reasons. And not only is it bad science, it's inherently contradictory. It leads to some totally crazy results. You've got the case of Michael Crow out in California, which I sure, I'm sure a lot of us know, a 14-year-old boy was interrogated about the death of his sister um, and eventually gave a, a persuaded, what looked to be a persuaded false confession that he had done it. But why did they suspect the brother would kill his sister in the first place? Well. After the girl's body was found, they thought that he didn't show enough uh, emotion upon discovering the body. He had a sort of a, what they thought was a lack of emotional response to this. So they thought that was suspicious, and they interrogated him under the principles of behavioral analysis. But you, can, you contrast that with Jeff Deskovic's case, for example, in other cases. Jeff Deskovic is out of New York. He was a 17-year-old uh, student, a little bit of a, uh, he, was a, he was a student, and there was a girl in his class a classmate of his who was murdered, and she had been a friend of Jeff. And 
he had, what the police regarded, was an overly emotional response. So in that case, the overly emotional response is what caused the interrogation. You can see these contradictions in behavioral analysis. You can't get it right. Um, but it causes such a toxic chain of events to be put into place. Uh, the consequences of misclassification and, and of relying on this behavioral analysis science uh, is, is the perpetuation of this human lie detector mythology that increases police confidence in the accuracy of these completely erroneous judgments. So it leads to investigator bias that carries throughout the course of the entire investigation that's passed on to the prosecutor that carries on even post-conviction. And most importantly for our purposes, this behavioral analysis stuff is, can be what triggers the decision to change a questioning session from an interview, open-ended, non-confrontational, to an interrogation, confrontational, accusatory, premised on the fact that the person you're talking to is guilty. But there are other types of misclassification errors out there. There's criminal profiling themes um, that abound amongst law enforcement, so just some of these. Um, if there's no signs of forced entry, it must be an inside job. Uh, the last person who is with the victim must be the killer. If it's a loved one who dies uh, at home, a family member must be responsible. All serial killers are white. We saw that one um, in the Beltway uh, sniper context quite a bit. A uh, it's incredibly frequent for law enforcement to attribute a, what they call a gang motive to a crime that occurs in a neighborhood that is quote unquote gang infested. And another common profiling theme is that if a killing is, appears to be a particularly bloody, particularly violent, there, there must have been satanic motivations at play. So anytime I see a report prepared by a criminal profiler that describes the kind of person who would have committed the crime, I take a much more close look at that case. There are a number of documented, proven false confessions where police, because they hadn't any leads and because the case was growing cold, retained a criminal profiler and got a description of the kind of person who would have committed the crime. In Jeff Deskovitz's case, I see Jeff here, they found, uh, they got a profile of, of the person, who they said he was five foot 10, white or Hispanic, was, knew the victim, um, was, was a loner, um, and, the, vic the, the, the perpetrator turned out to be over six feet black and a stranger to the victim. But that profile caused them to focus on people in her immediate circle, in her school, and led them astray. So here's a good example of um, the power of these sorts of profiling myths um, in the West Memphis Three case, which is, of course, a very high profile case out of West Memphis, Arkansas, uh, involving the deaths of three eight-year-old boys who were killed in a particularly, or at least it appeared, were killed in a particularly brutal fashion. Their bodies were found naked, submerged in a stream of water. They'd been hogtied with their own shoelaces, and the bodies were covered with what appeared to be uh, cuts and bruises and lacerations and mutilations of various kinds. It's a horrible discovery for the people of this small town. And it triggered one of these profiling myths. Because of the apparent brutality of this crime, it must have been satanically motivated. And these are two uh, early police reports that uh, were from that case. You can see uh, on, the, on the left a very, very early police report right after the, after the discovery of the body, the case number uh, in the box 93-05-0555. Well, after the criminal profiling myth of Satanism took place, took hold, and began to spread. You can see in later police reports, lower right, that case number changed, 9305666. Another uh, snapshot from the West Memphis Three case. This is, again, shows the power of these misclassification myths and how they can saturate and contaminate every part of an investigation once they take hold. This is um, a, a receipt of evidence gathered during the execution of a search warrant at Jason Baldwin's house, one of the defendants. You can see the items highlighted in, in yellow. Let's see, they found 10 black shirts up there at top, another black shirt, and then four black shirts down at the bottom. This was gathered as evidence and was actually introduced in tri at trial against this kid, the fact that he owned black shirts. 
that was viewed as evidence of Satanism, which in turn was viewed as evidence of guilt. This is how pervasive and ridiculous these misclassification errors can become. So I'm going to um, go through this rather quickly because this is the stuff of the voluntariness pretrial hearings that most of you are accustomed to. Um, but the coercion error feeds off the misclassification error. The suspect who they are convinced is innocent for whatever reason denies that they were involved in the crime. The more the suspect denies, the angrier the police officers get, the more frustrated they get. The more frustrated the police officers get, the more they up the pressure on the suspect. And the more likely it is that they will cross that gray line between what is and is not acceptable coercion. The interrogation process, unlike the interview, is guilt presumptive. It's accusatorial, it's suggestive. It is an interrogator-dominated interaction. More than 90% of the talking is gonna be done by your interrogator. And they are allowed to use deception, they're allowed to manipulate, and they're allowed to use coercive psychological methods that either suggest or imply a benefit or some, some harm to the defendant. If you look at enough of these tapes as I have, what you see is that they almost always begin the same way. There's a break after the interview. The interrogator leaves the room, lets the suspects do for a few minutes, and then comes back into the room. And with the suspect seated, the interrogator stands over him and says, we're not here to talk about whether you committed the crime. We already know that. Our investigation has shown us that. And then they may launch into a few false evidence ploys. What we need to know is why you committed the crime. Because why you committed the crime will enable us to help you. And that confrontation, that first accusation of guilt or the belief that the suspect is guilty, then comes to lead the interrogator to interrupt every time the, the suspect tries to assert his innocence or deny. And Joe Buckley is very clear about this. He's got his tapes with the Reed and Associates group, and he says, you have to interrupt these assertions of innocence because the more a suspect asserts his innocence, the more psychologically tied he gets to that position. And we have to break him from that position. Oftentimes they will move closer to the suspect, they'll move their seat closer, um, and then they use both minimization and maximization. The maximization is the interrupting of denials, the certainty of the evidence against them, um, the uh, overstatement of the evidence against them, the use of false evidence ploys, but the minimization involves providing the suspect a face-saving excuse for why they committed the crime. If you just, if it was just an accident, we can work with that. If it was impulsive, not premeditated. If it was in self-defense, in a rape case, if it was consent both legal and moral excuses that explain why the suspect might have committed the crime. Sometimes it's the, it's the race to the witness phenomenon. In multiple defense cases, everybody wants that witness status as opposed to the suspect status. Just tell us you were there. We know you weren't the primary perpetrator here. You were there and you played a bit role um, and you get a lot of interlocking confessions where everybody's the witness and they're pointing the fingers at each other. The classic read technique is the presentation of an alternative question, a forced choice question that gives the suspect one of two choices, 
and the suspect, if he's rational and he's going to answer the question, is going to pick the lesser of two evils. Was this planned or did it happen in the spur of the moment? Okay. Um, and we know, and you'll hear about more about this in the third hour, um, when we talk about the psychological science backing for the power of minimization. But the, when suspects hear these alternative scenarios that imply leniency, they think just that. If I accept that lesser scenario, I'm going to be treated more leniently. They don't have to be told that. They get it. They read between the lines through a process called pragmatic implication. Reed uh, tells his interrogators, that's not our fault if they read between the lines. We can't be responsible for the, what they think, but in fact, that's what the entire interrogation process is. It's about shaping and confining the choices of the suspect and making some of those choices appear rational and others appear unrational, irrational. And so the power of minimization is often, as you saw in the initial video, when children are involved, People confess because they think that by doing so, they'll be allowed to go home. And when you are under pressure for that long, home is the great life preserver, the opportunity to get out, to be with family, and to put an end to the stress of an interrogation. And in each one of these cases, that was the reason that caused the defendant to crack. It's important to talk a little bit about polygraphs and their role in interrogations. Um, there are legions of polygraph-induced false confessions or voice stress analyzer-induced false confessions. These are instruments that police officers use purportedly to tell whether or not a suspect is being deceptive with regard to the crime at issue, but more often than not, they are used as ruses to break a suspect down to a place of hopelessness and get the suspect to confess. Many times you will see a suspect ask for a polygraph. Let me take a polygraph. I'm sure I'll pass it. Um, and police officers will comply, but sometimes they lie about the results of that polygraph. And when that polygraph is not the life preserver, is not the, the, um, the vehicle that's going to save the suspect, it becomes that much easier to manipulate them into confessing. So how do police officers use these to break a suspect down? I'm going to show you a tape, a very brief blurb of a video. I may need Laura's help here. Let's see. This is an interrogation of a young man named Matthew Livers, who was a client at the Center on Wrongful Convictions. Uh, oh, let's see, something came up. All I had to do was stand up? Yeah. And this is the way the interrogators approached him after he took the polygraph test um, and thought that the polygraph test was going to be his savior. Guys, I have nothing to do with this. Let's, let's, just, let's just get this out of the open, okay? We're seeing a different side of you, okay? Before you were pleasant, you were, you know, we're starting to see a different person come out. Listen, we trust these, these this is a tool that's used. Well, listen, let me, let me speak, okay? This is a tool that's used, okay? If you came in here, you knew that. You answered questions, and the questions that you were honest about show that you're honest. We have no reason to lie to you, but let me ask you a question that specifically has to do with the death of Wayne. You fly off the chart. I, I, we've been, these guys have been doing hundreds of these. I, hundreds. Listen, we can see you. We've been watching you. 
Okay? We've been watching. You're involved in this up to your ears. And if you think this will go away, this is a high-profile case. This will not go away. How am I involved in this? I'm not. You are involved in it. How? I can read the questions they ask you, and your emotions are just flying off the chart. I mean, I'm Your not. subconscious body is telling the machine, you cannot fool it. I didn't have anything to do with this. You did. I did not. You did. I did not, Bill. You did. No, oh, I did. I'm sorry. You did. Okay? We now know. We now know. The two of us know. And this will go like dogs with a bone. This will not go away for you. So this machine doesn't know you. It's an unbiased observer. Um, and we place utmost faith in the results of this machine. And it found that you were lying. And Laura, I need your help. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There you go. OK. Actually, it's my turn anyway. There you go. <laughs> Okay, so we've talked about the misclassification error, which is, you know, how did police get the wrong person in the interrogation room in the first place? And we've talked about the coercion error, which is once that person is in the interrogation room, how do they get motivated to make a statement that is so drastically against their self-interest as a false confession? So then there's the third error that we investigate when we look at these cases, um, and it's the contamination error. Once that will is broken, once you decide to make that damning admission, how do you know what to say about a crime when you weren't even there? That's the contamination error, and that's a key part of the story that you've got to be able to explain when litigating these cases. So what is contamination generally? It's when facts are adopted by the person who's giving the confession by sources, and he or she adopts these facts from sources other than his or her own personal knowledge. This happens all the time, and you can see it especially when, of course, the interrogation is videotaped. A lot of the time, the source of contamination is actually the interrogating officer. He's doing the interrogation, he's using leading questions, um, perhaps showing photographs of the crime scene, perhaps even taking the person back to the crime scene to walk through it to say, look, this is, you know, this is how it looks. Of course, this is all a process of education. The person being questioned hears these leading questions, sees these photographs, and then knows what later to describe after their will has been broken and they decide to falsely confess. Uh, we have a case involving a young woman who was killed by being shot in the head. And the young man who was being interrogated about it um, didn't know that, didn't know how she had died. He just know, knew that she'd been murdered. And the interrogation was recorded and it revealed this extraordinary guessing game. You know, his, his, name is, his name is Brendan and they say to him, Brendan, how did she die? Just tell us. And he says, well, we punched her. No, that's not right. So they say, well, Brendan, you know, what else did you do? What else? And he says, well, uh, we stabbed her. No, wrong. So they say, Brendan, okay, what else? What else? Something with the head, Brendan. Something with the head. And he says, um, we choked her? Wrong. So they say, no, something with the head. Come on, come on. And he says, okay, we, and now he's totally at a loss. He says, we cut off her hair. And they say, they're getting frustrated, of course. And they say, no. And, and finally, he just says, look, I can't, I can't remember. I don't know. I can't think of anything else. And they say to him, Brendan, why don't you just come out and tell us? Who shot her in the head? And he says, oh, the other guy did that. And they say, Brendan, why didn't you just tell us that? And he said, I think quite truthfully, because I couldn't think of it. He just couldn't think of another way that somebody would be killed. Um, but at that, when we saw that in this particular confession, it was just such a powerful instance of, of this sort of macabre process of contamination that can happen during these false confession cases. Um, but it doesn't have to only come from the officers. And I should say, sometimes, often, this is, comes from the officers inadvertently. Of course, they're frustrated with this guy's not giving them what they think they know. And they sort of slip into leading questions inadvertently. But there are other ways that this can happen. Uh, contamination can occur when a case is very high profile um, or is, it happens to somebody in the community. The defendant may well know uh, rumors, gossip about what happened, may well have read newspaper articles about the case. That's what happened in, in the Daniel Villegas case that I mentioned earlier, the drive-by shooting in El Paso. At some point during the, the questioning, he actually tells the officers, I read about this case in the El Paso Times. I know who was shot. I went to school with those guys. And that's part of what he eventually incorporates 
into his confession. And then finally, there's innocent knowledge of the crime scene. There are cases where um, somebody confesses to a crime that happened at their house. Well, it's going to be no big surprise that they can draw a map of the layout of the house with perfect accuracy. It doesn't mean anything about whether they're guilty or innocent. It just knows that they, means that they know where their own bathroom is. Um, but of course, these are all different ways in which a person can be educated about a crime scene, about the way a crime happened without actually having participated. And when we look into these cases, that's a critical thing that we try to answer. How did this person know what they said during the interrogation? This is a beautiful quote on the right-hand side before I change slides from Commander Neil Nelson, who's an officer in St. Paul, Minnesota. He says, after and he's speaking about the power of a recording in this instance, he says, after reviewing a recorded interrogation, you realize maybe you gave too much detail as you tried to encourage the suspect and he just regurgitated it back. Beautiful, if only all police officers thought that way, thought like Commander Nelson, but he's describing this, this problem of contamination. So what do we do when we have a confession? How do we try to answer this question about contamination, about how the person knew what it is they were talking about that ended up in the confession? Well, we ask ourselves two questions, fit and contamination. What's fit? This is basic. Does the confession match the crime scene facts? Did they get things right? Okay. We go detail by detail. We break down every single detail in the confession. I often do it in a, in a chart form. Who, what, where, when, why? What type of gun was used? What, was, what happened right before? What happened right afterwards? Was anything said? Any detail that ended up in that final statement, I write down. And then I go back through the police reports and I try to just do a basic comparison. What did they get right? And what did they get wrong? But there's a key second step to that process. Most, remember, most people who have been exonerated and who have falsely confessed did get a lot of those facts right in their confession. So you have to ask a second question. How did they get them right? That's where contamination comes into play. And that's when I take this sort of list of all the details, who, what, where, when, why. And I try to say, well, look, for this detail, is there any way the person might have known this other than being present at the crime scene? Is this a fact that was widely circulated in the news? Is this a fact that was disclosed to them by the police officers during the interrogation? Which, of course, it helps if you have a recording to answer that question. Um, does this, the bottom line is, does the confession contain, an, contain accurate but non-contaminated details? If it does, that's a red flag for truthfulness. If it doesn't, that's a red flag for falsity, and that's a powerful argument against falsity. If this person can't get anything right unless they're being told, that's a powerful message to send to the courts. Interrogators are briefed by most of the other investigators in these cases before they go in the interrogation room. It's important that they know all the facts. So it's really important to begin from the minute the body is found up until the time of interrogation to find out what knowledge the police officers had about how the crime occurred. And if that knowledge was present before the interrogation and it ends up in the actual confession, you have an inference there that there may have been contamination. So I mentioned that I often do this in chart form. I wasn't kidding. It's not, um, it's not you know, the most exciting thing you've ever done, but you, what you end up with is such a powerful tool for demonstrating truth or falsity. This is just a real short little example of a particular confession in one of, our, in one of the cases we've been involved with. Um, these are two details, right? Um, on the top row, it's um, a detail about whether the crime was planned ahead of time or not. The second bottom row is where did the crime take place? These are two details that, were, that ended up in the final confession, planning where it happened. So for the first top row, you can see they gave a statement to the police. This particular defendant gave a statement to the police um, about planning. There was a phone call early in the morning. They discussed whether or not they were going to go to the scene, and then they went. Um, there, this is an uncontaminated detail. Nobody told this person this information. Uh, the defendant said that this was planned without it being suggested to him by the police officers. There was nothing in the media about planning. Totally uncontaminated. But in this case, there was no physical evidence, no telephone records, nothing to actually indicate that this planning had happened. So the person got this fact wrong. Okay, so we look at row two. Where did the crime take place? This defendant said it took place in the woods uh, behind the truck wash. Well, okay, this actually turned out to be correct. That is the location where this particular 
crime happened. But if you look back, then you can identify that, ah, in fact, this was a contaminated detail. This was all over the news that this crime happened, uh, as it turns out, in the woods behind the truck wash. It was all over the news, and it was fed to the person during the interrogation. We knew that from the transcript of the interrogation. And if you do this and play this out over the course of the entire confession, what, what we ended up with in this case was this amazing chart that showed where there was contamination, the person got it right. Where there was not contamination, the person got it wrong over and over and over. And when you play that out, that is so powerful. Then you can say quite accurately, this person couldn't say a single thing about how this crime happened without having it placed in his mouth by someone else. So this is something else we like to do when we look at um, statements, unrecorded statements. Um, this is a, a portion of a handwritten confession from a case out in New York. Um, I, the defendant's name, know an individual by the name of Bugs, who I owed $200 to for some crack that I received from him to sell. Instead of selling the crack, I used it for my own personal use. This is strange language, and let me say that the defendant in this case is 16 years old. Um, is this how a 16-year-old talks? I don't think so, right? Um, since this period, I've been using it on and off. This is a very formalistic language, and this isn't his story. This isn't the story of a 16-year-old. The language itself is the language that a police officer would use. I know an individual by the name of Bugs. No one talks like that. When you see a confession like this with this type of formalized sort of law enforcement language, we point that out too as evidence of that at least raises an inference of contamination. Okay, so we've talked about the three errors. We've talked about misclassification, coercion, and contamination, those three things that we always sort of focus our investigation around. And I want to show you how it plays out in a case with a tape-recorded interrogation. And then after that, we'll talk about how to do it when you don't have the benefit of a recording. So we talked a little bit already about Robert Davis's case. At the beginning, this is a case from Virginia from 2003, in which a woman named Nola Charles was stabbed to death at home and a cover-up fire was set, uh, the smoke from which then killed her three-year-old son from smoke inhalation. Uh, the two teenage daughters who slept in the downstairs of the house were able to get out of the house on time, uh, ahead of time, without being harmed. This, the immediate suspects were teenage neighbors of, of the Charleses named Rocky and Jessica Fugit, part of the Fugit family. They were siblings. Jessica suffered from mental illness, and she was friends with the daughter of the woman who was killed. Rocky and Jessica, brother and sister, were brought in. They were interrogated by police, and each gave statements implicating themselves in the crime, statements which I believe happened to be true. Um, both of them, though, implicated a host of others, a host of others, all students from their school, and they included 18-year-old Robert Davis in that list of names. Now, the police checked out all those lists of names, uh, all those other names. Most people had rock-solid alibis. Robert's alibi was that he was at home, asleep. His mom was at home, asleep in her room. Not a great alibi. The police decided to interrogate him. So they, he was arrested shortly after midnight on February 22, 2003, at gunpoint. And, he, and they proceeded to interrogate Robert Davis, who they believed was the third perpetrator. And I, and I pulled out some video clips from this interrogation so I can show you, I hope, the ways in which Robert Davis, who's 18 years old, a fairly intelligent, savvy, kind of, you know, quote unquote, normal seeming guy, could go from vehement denials over the course of this interrogation to admitting to a horrible arson murder that he had nothing to do with. Um, and it's this kind of story that we look to be able to tell when we investigate these kinds of cases. So I'd like to start out with a clip showing the types of accusations that were made against Robert, the way the police accused him. Then do the other thing. Don't turn around. No, just face it away from me. And then if you would, do the same thing with your other hand. Take two steps forward and put your hands down. Your spot. It's the story tell all the way so much with Robert, you would be charged with the murder of Nola Charles, of Thomas Charles. You would be charged with the attempted murder of the two Charles daughters, Katie and Wendy. You're charged with breaking and entering with the intent to commit larceny and the nighttime of his mom. You're charged with robbery. 
Now it's really gotten serious, hasn't it? Yes, it has. Exactly right. And you would not be charged with that, Robert, if we didn't have reason to believe or know that you were in that house during the time that the things took place in that house. Now this is the time right here, Robert, when you need to start to step up and say what you saw, what happened, because we already got most of it. And, and I tell you what, if you don't speak for yourself, then you're in that house by yourself and doing everything yourself. And you're going to get the blood. So that's I'm not going to lie to you. Stop, stop telling the truth. I am telling you the truth. I am telling you the truth. I had nothing to do with this. I swear to God, I will tell you, I, I swear to God all my life right now that I did not do nothing of this matter. I had nothing to do with this. I will take a polygraph test right now to prove to you that I did not have nothing to do with this. You know and I know that I'm not capable of doing something like this. I did not kill nobody. I cannot, I cannot even kill a fucking fly, man. Okay, so that's, so those are some of the accusations and denials that happened at the beginning of this interrogation. And as we know from behavioral analysis, Robert's already in the thick of it because he said stuff like, I swear to God I didn't do this, which of course means you're, you're guilty of sin. Um, he also said, you know, I'm not capable of doing something like this. I couldn't even kill a fucking fly. All of this is like, you know, deception written all over it, according to, to Reed uh, and Associates. But you can notice a couple of other things that, from the clip, the posture, right? I mean, these officers are, are cornering Robert. Robert's 18 years old. He's well over six feet tall. He's a big, big guy. But they've got him in the corner, literally isolating him as well as figuratively. Um, and, and, and you can see that, that sort of physical sense of pressure in the video as well. And you can see they tell him from the beginning, we know. We know you did this crime. There's certain things. We know it was you, Robert. And that's the power of the accusation. Of course, he responds at first with, with denial. Then it proceeds to what we call the false evidence ploy. You know your skin is the worst thing in the world as far as dust? You can't even see it. Dust is made of most of us human thin skin. That can be picked up, that DNA. That stuff right there, if you touched anything, the glove part can be picked up and match with the shirt. The same thing with the gloves. I can match it to the exact one you wore. Right, exactly. Of course, he did just lie about the evidence. There was no DNA evidence at all anywhere in the scene. There was no physical evidence whatsoever linking Robert to this crime scene. But he was just uh, told, essentially, that his DNA evidence was at the scene. This is part of the process of what Steve referred to as maximization, of presenting the evidence of guilt as completely unshakable, and part of the process of breaking that suspect's confidence down and down and down until the point of hopelessness. Threats and promises. I told your mom that I would sit here trying to keep you from the most ultimate punishment you can get. And I'm trying to do that, and you're not even helping me help you. I can't do no more. I can't speak for you, son. The only way you can get out of this is by talking the truth and saying you're a part of it. And the thing is, you're not going to get out of it, Robert. I'm not going to lie to you. You're not going to get out of it. But you might, you might save your life. And the thing is, if you don't come out and tell the truth and, and admit to whatever part you did, then when we go to the criminal judge, I can't say that you cooperated. And then we'll put you away for 90 years. I'm trying to go 90 years, if not worse. And now, you know, I mean, I mean, if you cooperate, who's in the judge is in control? The judge looks at a guy and goes, man, he cooperated, he didn't cooperate. There's a lot of people in this house. A lot of people have different roles. If you were just in the house, 
That's a that's one thing. Standing right. guard or something. Okay. Being in the house is one thing. Being you know doing other things is another thing. Let's establish. Let's you know let's do this. You know don't don't. We know we know you were there. Not, we know you were there. It's not there. It, it's not that big of a deal. If you were just in the house, Ron, that's not that big of a deal. I was not in the house. If you cooperate with me, then I can work with the Commonwealth and say that you cooperate with me. But son, if you don't cooperate with me, then I can't do that. And then I, then I can't tell your mom that I can save you from the ultimate. I can't tell your mom the truth and try to help your mom. I can't do that. I can't tell my husband I can save Robert because Robert wouldn't work with me. And I was killing you on that phone back there. Your mom is upset. She loves you, Robert, no matter what. She's loving you. And I'm doing the best to kind of keep that family tie alive. No matter what you've done, she said, I still love you. He's my son. No matter what he's done. And I said, Sandra, I know. And I'm trying to get him to work with me. If he works with me, I will do everything I can to help you see him and get through this. But if I can't do that, I can't, I can't do that without him telling me the truth. Okay, so now we're talking about real pressure, right? You've got somebody in this interrogation room who's 18 years old, who's been told that his DNA is on the scene, the officers won't listen to him protesting his innocence, and now they're telling him that he faces the ultimate punishment, and that his mother knows that he's facing the ultimate punishment. And in effect, his mother's gonna be devastated by his death, or by 90 years incarceration, unless he tells uh, what the police officer believes to be the truth. And so you can see now this, this process of reducing Robert down. He's, he's, he's being brought absolutely down to this place of hopelessness, right? You're gonna, we know you did it. We've got your DNA evidence completely false. We've got your DNA evidence on the scene and you're gonna get the death penalty and how's your mom gonna handle that unless I can go in front of the judge and say you cooperated. Okay, that gets Robert to a place where he decides to confess. This goes on over the course of hours, of course. And now we come to the contamination error. Once Robert gets to that place, how does he know what to say? What can I say that I did to get me out of this? I held her down when they tied her up. Yeah. And then I hit her two times. Because they said if it was, if I didn't hit her, it would be Wait a I got somebody else clubbing her, Robert. I got someone else doing that act. You did another act. You know what that act is. And, and, and we know. And that's the thing that has you, something on it that, that's yours. What would that be? Robert, I, I'm going to come straight and tell you what, I was, what, what I'm getting. All right? Since you're not going to tell me. All right? You did not, you did another act. All right? You did another act to, to that lady. And you can sit here and say, oh, I got three other stories telling me what you did. And why you keep not wanting to say it, was either way, clubbing or doing the other act are the same thing. Except in the fact, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I don't know exactly what you're talking about. Did you, and I'm going to ask you, I'm going to bring it, I'm going to bring it out as a question, and I, I, but I know the answer. Did you or did you not stab that woman? No. I was not lying to you about that. I did not stab her. I had the knife, though, and I don't know if it stabbed her or not, but I didn't stab her. If, if I did, I didn't mean to. You know what you did, and, and you, you stabbed that woman. I stabbed her. We are really going on my way around with you. Would it make you feel better if we told you yes, exactly who was, who was with you? Yes, it would. If it was actually telling you. If I'm not hanging out with you, I, I can tell you that I would not hang out with these people because I don't want to. But you know that kind of debates the purpose, though, right? Yeah. I mean, you understand that? Is when, whenever we have to start telling you what you already know. This is the, 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 but, but if that helps you, maybe, I can, maybe we can do that. Yeah, I couldn't have described contamination better myself, right? Um, if we have to start telling you what you already know, that does defeat the purpose. It absolutely does. Um, and that's how, that's just an example of how it plays out in these interrogations. Um, so that's how Robert comes to confess to stabbing Nola Charles. He goes on to give other details that are similarly contaminated, just as that one was. 
Um, and then I've got to show you this because I just like the end of this uh, interrogation. It's a pretty good recantation, uh, but of course that just pissed the officer off. It, it wasn't like a, a smart move, but it, it's the truth, right? He was lying full-fledged to his face. Um, but you can see there the arc of an interrogation that it lasted six hours but compressed into those little clips. How Robert was moved from somebody who said, give me a polygraph test. I did not do this. I swear to God I didn't do this. I wouldn't even kill a fucking fly. How he moved down that arc of hopelessness until he was in a place where he just said, what can I say I did to get me out of this? Okay, so that's the kind of story that you want to be able to tell um, when you have a recording. But there are a lot of cases that don't involve recording. Um, Sadly. So we have a couple of suggestions for how to tackle this sort of investigation um, absent to recording. And I think I'm actually supposed to turn it over to Steve at this point, so I will sit down. <laughs> so we show you these video clips, and, and they seem to be ludicrous. And we laugh when we hear it. But Robert Davis was convicted of first uh, a first-degree murder, and he's still in prison today. And he had a phenomenal criminal defense lawyer who moved to suppress his confession. And if that confession with those kinds of threats isn't enough to be coercion, what is? But once he lost that confession, he was faced with, the suppression was faced with a kid who was looking at the death penalty in a state that executes people faster than in any other state in the country. Um, and so he entered an Alford plea and we're working on Robert's case in a clemency fashion. So it, is, it, is, it seems to us ludicrous that there are judges that would allow this to happen, but it happens, and it happens all too frequently. So when you don't have a recording, it's a much harder job, but it's not impossible. And as I said before, what you need to do is you need to follow the police investigation and find out when the facts were discovered by the police. We know that police talk to one another and that interrogators do not interrogate suspects unless they have most of the facts. And so if the only correct information in that confession comes from the police, you have the ability to argue that it was contamination. And Devante Sanford is a case, another unbelievable case, where a 14-year-old boy confessed and he had an awful attorney and he pled guilty and is serving all, well over 50 years in Michigan for a quadruple murder that was committed by a man who turned out to be a contract serial hitman. And he came forward and admitted to it and he was in possession of the gun and he can't get out of prison, in part because there was a drawing that was made of the crime scene that he agreed to that suggested he had been inside the house. Uh, but he didn't do the drawing. Next thing you do is you compare information in the public domain to correct information in the confession. When they get the facts right, you need to find a source for those facts. Sometimes they will get facts right but it's a matter of a 50-50 guess. In one of our cases, prosecutors went to town over the fact that the, the victim was shot in the left side of the head, or that somebody, found, somebody was carrying a, a uh, baseball cap in his right front pocket. Um, you know, there's a 50-50 chance that it's gonna be on the left side of the head as opposed to the right side of the head. And we found it much more important that he said to the suspect, which side of the head did you shoot him in? He happened to guess right, and that was considered to be a fact that only the true perpetrator would know. The same thing goes for rumors and gossip and news reports. 
you need to find a source for the information. This is not on the slide, but the DNA, if you will, in a contamination case without a recording is what's called a false fed fact. And what happens in these cases, and there are quite a few of them, is that early in an investigation, police officers develop a theory of how the crime must have occurred. And they get the suspect to adopt that theory. And later on, after all the test results are in, we find out that that theory was wrong. And so the fact that the suspect confessed to a false theory, especially if you have police reports that suggest the police had this theory, is a false fed fact and is extremely powerful evidence of contamination. There was a false fed fact in Nicole Harris's case. The police officers who went back to the crime scene for whatever reason couldn't envision how this child had strangled himself. The bed sheet that the string was hanging from would have been thrown from the bed and it was on the ground. And that didn't seem like a logical way for someone to kill themselves. So a police officer took a phone from one room, stretched the cord to see if it would go all the way into the bedroom, and came up with the idea that the child had been strangled by his mother with the phone cord. The very first confession that Nicole supposedly gave was to strangling her child with the phone cord. But when the police went to the medical examiner and showed them the phone cord and the elastic band, it was clear that the ligature marks on the child's necks came from the elastic band. So they had to get Nicole 20 hours later to admit to wrapping the elastic band around the child's neck. That false fed fact was in every single pleading we filed. We argued that it was evidence of contamination and nobody picked it up until the Seventh Circuit and we got a wise judge who recognized that that was evidence of contamination and that the confession was false. Why would someone falsely confess to going to the trouble to strangle someone with a phone in another room, phone cord from another room, um, and then later on change that story to something that is arguably less heinous, using a string that's right in her own presence. So false fed facts are the gold you look for in these cases. Now, we investigate within the four corners of the confession and we try to find sources for all the information in the confession, both right and wrong. Um, and then we look outside the confession and we do any kind of forensic testing that can be done, including DNA testing, even DNA testing that's not gonna be dispositive DNA testing. If there's an exclusion, the more exclusions there are of pieces of evidence, the more powerful the evidence is that somebody may be innocent. We've done ballistics testing, even though um, ballistics testing may not be the most reliable form of testing. But in Illinois, we have a statute that allows us to do the ballistic testing, to make a motion for ballistic testing. And in one case, the ballistics that the police said came from the gun that was recovered in our client's possession actually were found to be a closer match to, a, to other ballistics evidence that was in the IBIN database. Um, and fingerprints, are, of course, you should retest fingerprints, just like with DNA, even if the science is not as exacting, if there are other people's fingerprints at the crime scene, that other person is a criminal, that other person doesn't know your client, um, and that other person has a pattern and practice of committing crimes similar to the one at hand that can be gold in undermining the reliability of a confession. We go out in the field. Um, no post-conviction lawyer should uh, file anything unless they've seen the crime scene. Um, you gotta go out in the field and you, it's often helpful to have a tour guide with you someone from the victim's family, somebody who the victim grew up with, who can help walk you through 
the crime scene and help you find and identify witnesses. We interviewed almost all of the other, of the original witnesses in the case. There are always, almost always in Chicago, multiple sources of police contamination and multiple errors in the same case. So if there is a coerced confession and a false confession, you almost always find a false and coerced witness statement. And over the years, once they are no longer under the thumb of the law, these witnesses may recant. So we, we, do, a, we do a lot of re-interviewing of witnesses. We file all the, the post-conviction discovery motions. We look for and try to find Brady material anywhere we can. Um, we look and see whether the, the attorney involved has any history of IAC um, or malpractice complaints to buttress any IAC claims. Um, we look anywhere we can for information where there is discussion about this crime. We stalk, well, Laura stalks, uh, <laughs> online chat rooms, and we, we look at Facebook and look at people's Facebook pages, and we look at the comments in newspaper articles on online articles to see people who are talking with authority about our client's innocence and we've been able to track them down as witnesses, find them, and use that information in cases. Obviously, pattern and practice evidence with regard to officers is critical, and in Chicago there are, as in most or many jurisdictions, there is often one or two cops whose name come up over and over again in the context of false or coerced confessions. Um, we look for patterns of similar crimes in the same neighborhood. It's not easy to find these patterns, but you can get them through newspaper accounts sometimes. Um, and you also look for arrests of people who have been arrested for similar crimes to see whether or not you might be able to find and locate the true perpetrator. You know, Obviously, if you can point the finger at somebody else, you have a stronger case in, in challenging a false confession post-conviction. Um, if you can try to identify the real perpetrator, if you can narrow the circle of other suspects, you should try to do that. Sometimes it's not possible to do that. Sometimes all you have is a DNA exclusion, so your alternate suspect is Mr. DNA or Mr. Fingerprint. Um, but it's not essential to identify a real perpetrator. There are some things we'll talk about with regard to multiple false confession cases. I'll do this quickly. But the Central Park Jogger case taught uh, me a lesson that all of us should learn. And, and it's one that, that requires that you look at the statements of all of the defendants and compare them against each other. Because when you do that, you will often see that they are rife with the kind of inconsistencies that suggest that a story was formulated, that it was fed to one defendant, and then that that story was used to browbeat the other defendants into adopting the same or a similar story. But even, even when that happens, there are going to be inconsistencies among the accounts, especially when the suspect has to go on videotape and try to remember what happened or, or, or do it without it being written down for him to sign. And when you look at the Central Park Jogger cases, you see all kinds of inconsistencies on virtually every major aspect of the crime. And that was one of the reasons, in addition to the DNA evidence, why the state ultimately agreed to a motion to vacate the conviction. The DNA evidence was powerful. It was the, the central force for doing uh, for undoing that conviction, but even the district attorney's office in their affidavit recognized that they had to grapple directly with the confessions and deconstruct them. 
Um, Laura has talked about some of this stuff as well with the Bob Mylan portions. Um, and she's going to talk about how you translate the results of your investigation into a viable claim. Or am I going to talk break. about that? After the break. Thank God. <laughs>